Good morning, everybody. Thanks again for tuning into my YouTube channel. And uh, before we start, I have to talk about the weather, right? Because I'm British and uh, we always talk about the weather. And frankly, it's rubbish. It's cold, it's miserable, it's nearly May. And I'm just a little bit moody with the weather at the moment. I was in Berlin a couple of weeks ago. The weather was gorgeous, absolutely beautiful. And in fairness, the weather here was pretty good then also. But since then, it's just been terrible. So I'm hoping it will cheer up for my wedding this weekend. I have weddings all the way now through to kind of the end of July and um, I'm really hoping that the uh, the sun starts shining. So one of the questions I get asked a lot, I've been, uh, you know, I'm a big advocate for smaller cameras and those of you that have been seeing my Instagram posts where I've been going through my uh, history of Fujifilm cameras and other cameras also, uh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm, I'm big on the small cameras. I really love the small cameras. And that was the reason why I originally left my DSLR system was purely based on the size of the camera initially. Now, I have a GFX, which is this camera here. It's big, it's heavy, uh, it's cumbersome. Um, and it's, I'm getting questions, you know, why have you bought the GFX? And the answer is pretty simple. It's the print quality. The images that come out of it are amazing, absolutely amazing. So I want to kind of just set the record straight, I guess, a little bit about the differentiation between the APS-C system and the medium format system. And then we also have this, this kind of new camera, the X-H1, that's been thrown into the mix also. What Fujifilm are doing is catering for lots of different people, and that's a good thing. The X-H1 is not a camera for me, stills camera. I think it's too big and too heavy. Uh, there's not enough of a difference for me to uh, consider investing in that camera because, as I said, I have to buy these cameras too. And I don't see the X-H1 as an upgrade from the X-T2. I see the X-H1 as a completely new line, and, and that's why they've called it X-H rather than X-T3 or something, I guess. And it's perfect for those people that want a bigger camera. They want the mirrorless system. They want the Fujifilm ecosystem, but perhaps they just want a bigger camera. And that's cool, and that camera exists for them, and it's very good for them. I've, I've, you know, I've, I loaned that camera for a couple of weeks and it is excellent at what it does, especially the video stuff actually. Um, however, today we're talking about the GFX and the GFX is a camera that reminds me in many ways of the X-Pro1. It's, uh, it makes you think a little bit, it makes you slow down, it makes you consider the images more and I think that in itself is a good thing. Now, of course, when the X-Pro1 came out, we all started using that, or the people that were investing in the uh, Fujifilm system at the time were investing in that. And one of the things about slowing down and taking your time, it, you know, it was a good thing, but really at the back of our mind, we were all thinking, I wish it was just a bit faster. I wish the autofocus was faster. I wish it had better higher ISO, etc. And Fujifilm have worked their little butts off to build a system that caters for those people and caters for people like me. I now require fast cameras, cameras that can work very efficiently, have fast autofocus and are reliable. And they've done that. You know, we went through the X-T1, the X-T2, the X-Pro2 and now obviously the X-H1. And those cameras are amazing and they have retained their size. They're small. Um, now, I prefer the rangefinder star camera. So I prefer the X-Pro2 over the X-T2. I prefer the X-E3 over the X-E3. Uh, XT20, I should say, and that's basically personal uh, opinion. I like the preferences. I like the, I like the uh, ergonomics of those cameras. I should say I like the the rangefinder style. Inside the cameras are pretty much the same. So you know they are building this system for everybody. And then when the medium format system came along, it was kind of like a whoa, this is a complete game changer, I suppose. And uh, I've never used medium format before, so I can't compare it with anything else. All I can tell you is that I think for uh, the money that you pay for something like this and what you get, I think it's very, very worthwhile. I think there's a lot of value for money in that. I've never used a Hasselblad, I've never used a Phase One, so I can't compare the quality, I can't compare the pricing even. All I can say is that this camera, the reason why I bought it in the end was because of the file quality and the print quality from those images. I'm a business, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a photographer that makes money from business, you know, from selling pictures and I'm not a person who's going to have a vanity camera. I'm not going to purchase this camera just to have it to say I've got it. It has to make money for me. And the fact is I, I rented this camera for the best part of a month before I made the decision to purchase it. And when I did, it was based entirely on the fact that it had to make money for me. When it's in my camera bag, it has to be making money. Now, the fact is that I do occasionally take it to weddings and it's, especially the 
45 mil lens. It's very good for reportage style shooting as I do. Um, but really I think the medium format system is gonna sing for those people that are doing the beautiful group shots, editorial photography, bridal portraits, those things that are likely to be printed and shown and displayed. This camera is gonna be just perfect for you. For those like me that are doing fast reportage candid style photography, it can work and I've used it in a street photography environment also but the thing about it is it is bigger it's more obvious you do have to slow down it's not as reactive so the conditions need to be right the parameters of the day need to be right the wedding needs to be right the light needs to be right the GFX is not particularly great in really low light environments and so you know this camera this GFX is definitely a uh, a companion to my X series or my APS-C X series. It's not a replacement, it just can't be. Um, I will be shooting all of the weddings I've shot this year so far have been shot on X-Pro2s, X100s, X70s, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I would only really start thinking about taking this when the sun finally comes, if it ever gets here. And, uh, you know, I've got kind of some um, good time during the drink reception, etc., to start exploring and start using this, this camera a bit more at the weddings. However, where it is making money for me and where I'm using it the most is on my day in the life sessions, my family photography and also my personal photography because all of those images, by and large I should say, most of those images get printed and they are beautiful when they're printed. I just do not think that anybody who buys the GFX um, from a business point of view should buy it and then just upload the images to Facebook or Instagram and all that compression or even just leave them on the computer. It's a system that just absolutely needs to be printed. Um, the images, like I said, in those prints are superb and I'm gonna talk a little bit when we go to the computer about the dynamic range and the recovery and the file size and how to crop them or how I crop them and, and what I can do with those images. We'll talk about some of my favorite images that I've taken with it. And, you know, I'm just gonna give you a little overview, I guess, of how I use this medium format camera in my day-to-day -day business and the key thing there is that it's business it's not vanity I don't I don't maybe I do a little bit but I hopefully I don't have too much gas which is gear acquisition syndrome um, although you know I do I'm a big fan of kind of buying stuff and especially things that can be plugged in and charged I you know I love all that stuff so um, but you know that's not true with this camera it's 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 too much you know it's I've spent kind of eight or nine thousand pounds on this system now already and I give myself a target that by within 12 months that camera has to have made that money back for me to continue keeping it if it doesn't I will be selling the camera um, as it stands it's doing well I'm getting the the bookings I'm getting I'm showing people the prints and I'm showing them the quality of those prints and they are pretty much loving it so that's key now one thing that I would also say is that just because this is making beautiful prints doesn't mean that the uh, X-Pro2 or the X-T2 doesn't make beautiful prints also um, I've had prints printed for Fujifilm uh, at five meters wide I think four and a half meters wide for exhibitions and uh, from my X-Pro1 from JPEGs from the X-Pro1 so it does print but obviously the, the the physical fact is that on a bigger sensor with more dynamic range you will get better detail quality in those prints and you know larger quality prints or larger prints I should say. So that's where the GFX comes into play. I mean when you consider it, when you compare it to the X100 for example, size wise you know there's there's no comparison really it's it's just a much bigger system. However you know it's I know I keep banging on about the size and everything but I have to say that the the fact that I can handhold it and walk around with it and you know I took it to Spain and I shot um, which I'll show you some images I shot pretty much a whole month in Spain of my own family over the summer all handheld um, and you know it's medium format handheld 63 mil lens 45 mil lens I think that's got to be a good thing although like I said I have no um, no experience with other medium format systems so presume you can do the same thing with those although my research and my understanding is that typically you're going to be tripoding them you're going to be stabilizing them um, now I've seen the most amazing work from people like Damien Lovegrove his studio work and he prefers you know even when he's traveling he will have the um, uh, GFX on a tripod I think and his images are, are just 
dramatic and they're beautiful and they have depth and they have soul to them. He's making amazing images with them. We have people like Jonas Rask also who is running around with this as well as saving lives and doing whatever else he does in his life um, and making amazing personal images as well and you know street photography and you know he's not tripod in it he's using it just as I do which is handheld so uh, you know the, the camera is amazing um, it's big it's heavy it's amazing it produces amazing results that's the key so we'll go to the computer now I'm just going to talk through a few images show you a little bit of editing with them and uh, we'll see how we get on okay so the first thing we're going to look at are a few images I took at a day in the life session a few weeks back and you've seen some of these pictures before actually but as you can see they're using the metadata at the top I shot most of the day or well I shot the whole day on GFX 50 and XH1 the XH1 has subsequently gone back I was renting it at the time and the remainder in the, of the images were shot on the GFX which are the ones we are going to talk about today so we'll start with this one of uh, Maya and it's a good one to start with because of the, you know, it's quite a lot of shadow and highlighting there. I'll just reset the raw file. So this is the raw file. It's, uh, if I zoom in, you can see uh, the sharpness and the detail. And remember, this is a raw file that's just been imported into Lightroom. It's 1 250th of a second, f2.8 on the 63 mil lens. I'm just going to try and sort out some white balance here. Um, it's okay, I'll maybe move across, try her teeth. Sometimes teeth work, but that's going to be a bit too green. I'll go to the background, I think. If I can get those RGB values at the bottom of the target as close as possible. Now, of course, one of the big selling points of the GFX is the large sensor, which means a greater dynamic range, a greater capacity for exposure correction, etc. Now, if I just bring that histogram down there, you'll see that this image is not too badly exposed. Actually, it's a little bit stacked to the shadow area on the left. So I can just pull that histogram across or I can go down and try and adjust it with the shadows and the exposure sliders there. We have a lot of latitude, a lot of latitude in these files. And if I go down to the transform section, I'm just going to hit auto just to straighten it a, sec a second to make sure my OCD values of straightness are verified. I'm um, just gonna pop on my normal um, preset, my normal warm color preset onto this, which immediately brings the image to life, a little bit contrasty, so I'd need to adjust that. But now I need to look into the highlights, the shadows areas, because it's still quite dark in the background, and you know, see if I pull that to the right, it really does recover those details quite well there. I'm just gonna move the highlights slightly, and then pop the exposure up a little bit also with that particular image. And that's nice, you know, it's a nice image, it's good to go. If I zoom in, you can see the detail. The, the preview is rendered pretty quick. And in her hair and in her clothes. And, you know, it's nice detail, nice, very sharp. That's zoomed in at 100%. This is also a nice image from the day. I'm just going to uh, change the upright, just to make it a bit tighter there on the right-hand side to get the crop in. And, you know, it's a nice image. There's a lot of detail there in the background. Shadow is also just going to put my warm filter on it and obviously this needs a little bit more work to it so I'll then just drag the shadows across and you can just see it's very subtle but it's moving it across there exposure keep an eye on the histogram because that's the important thing just trying to get that right stacking it it's obviously dark there's a lot of dark areas in the background but look at the detail there in little baby's eye and you can zoom in and crop these GFX images amazingly it's it's just incredible the detail that's in them Okay, so now we have a really challenging image. If I bring this one up, this was very, very bright, harsh sunlight in the kitchen. And I'm just going to reset it again so you see the original raw file. Um, now, this is spot metered because I'm trying to actually do something with the shadow and the highlight area. And you can see, again, the histogram, it's stacked right to the left. If I start pulling these, uh, this image around using the exposure sliders, and you can see, you can just see the amount of data that's in there that's just incredible to be able to move and, and you know, tone this image accordingly. So I'm just going to try and get it a bit brighter and move that up again. Bring all that, that all the way down just to show you. I mean, that doesn't look good, but I'm trying to show you the amount of detail and data that's in that um, dynamic range. I'm just going to pop my warm black and white filter on it. And you can see there all of that dark area that's blown that's lost so if I bring the shadows all the way up you can just see as the blue disappears that's where the image is being recovered that's where the detail in the dark area is being recovered and I can go up a little bit further with the black slider and push it now not all of it will go um, because some of it is pure black and like I say it's a challenging image to get but you can see already all of that information that's in the background now the same is true with the highlights I've got the highlight blinkers on so it's showing in red 
So I just bring that down just a tiny bit and there we have it. The image is, is totally recovered from a somewhat badly exposed image um, that's kind of purposely shot like that, but also needed some work in post-production. This detail shot from a wedding that I took last year, this is using the 45mm uh, f2.8, which is around about 35mm full frame equivalent. Look at the detail in there when I zoom right in into the glass and into the flowers themselves. There's a lot of good detail, a lot of good dynamic range now. I'm gonna put my warm filter on it again. And in the background, look at the shadow and the highlight and also the sky in the background outside. It's just retaining all of that amazing information. Uh, I find it quite incredible. And like I said many times in the introduction, this isn't a camera that I'm gonna be using a lot at weddings because of the practicalities of it. But for things like this, the details, and if you're doing editorial group shots or fashion shoots or group or um, bridal portraits, etc., it's just amazing. Okay, so on to some of the images that I took last year. Um, when I first got the camera actually and I'd hired it, um, it's my little boy, obviously, um, he gets about. Didn't take that mask off for about a month. Just trying to sort out the white balance again on this image before we do any more work to it. Even if the image is gonna end up in black and white, I still like to get the, black, the white balance correct. I think that's important. Um, okay, so actually I'll do it color. I'll put my color warm filter on it just to kind of bring that image straight together again. Needs a little bit of brightness, I think. I'm just gonna pop it up, uh, bring that contrast down because uh, my preset is quite contrasty and sometimes it does need to be brought down. But look at the detail, look at the very fine hair. You can see it in his eyelashes and all the way around his face. And you know, you can just see the water droplets and they're clear. This is uh, 45 mil, one five thousandth, one one thousand five hundredth of a second at f2.8, ISO 100 handheld. And you know, it's a lovely shot and we have that framed and shown nice and big on our living room wall as all good GFX images should be. <laughs> okay, so street photography. Um, now, this guy's not moving particularly fast. This was taken in, uh, I think it was New York. And you can see again, the highlight area in the background. I've got the blinkies on to show that that red area is the blown highlights, um, or the bright highlights, I should say. I'm just gonna put the filter on first because my filter brings the highlights down um, quite a bit anyway. And so they're gone straight away, it's, it's all sorted. Um, and the image again comes to life straight away with that, that kind of warm color filter. It still needs a little bit of work, a little bit of brightening up. Now again, if we zoom in, look at this. This again is the 45 mm lens. It's 1 1 25th of a second, f2.8 handheld ISO 100. And it's just got incredible detail, I think, in all of those areas, sharp. The guy, uh, the guy was moving and he's not moving particularly quick but he's moving, you can see the spokes moving. So I had to pan the camera to try and keep it sharp. So, uh, you know, I'm quite happy with the result. It's, it's very sharp where it needs to be. So onto the weddings and, or back to the weddings. And this is a, I'll, I'll, I'll edit this as I talk over it. This is a um, reportage style image, obviously the 45 mil lens is pretty good for this stuff. Uh, again, like I said, you need the right light, you need the right parameters, you need the right type of wedding really to shoot it in a candid way, shoot with the camera in a candid way. It's doable, but it's, you know, it's heavier and it's more bulky. Um, and you know, you're really not gonna be getting those very fleeting moments. Now, this is an image that I shot in Spain uh, at dusk. This sun is kind of coming up over the, uh, going down over the horizon. And it's just a you know, snapshot really, it's a, it's a memory shot more than anything. I'm just gonna put my filter on there, which brings the highlights down automatically. And you can still see if I bring the highlight slider further, it's kind of recovered all that data, all that detail. Now that's the sun itself right ahead of us. You can see a kind of little bit of lens flare there in the, um, in the image where I'm shooting directly at that sun. And, uh, you know, I like this picture. It, it reminds me actually of uh, evenings that we have in Spain. We, we kind of always sit in this little area. Um, but it's, you know, that detail that's there is quite phenomenal, I think. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's really beautiful being able to get, capture that information and, and do something with it afterwards. Okay, so back to the weddings. Now this image, um, again, the 45 mil lens is at a place called Rest Park. I'm gonna, I think I'll do this as black and white. So I'm just gonna white balance it again. You know, like I said earlier, it's still important to get your white balance correct, even if you're gonna go black and white. And you can see straight away that I've got some uh, dark areas that need correcting. So I'm gonna just bring the shadow, high, uh, shadow slider up as far as possible. And of course, you're not always gonna get everything out because sometimes it is pure black. 
you can see the histogram is pretty good it's okay at the moment um, so yeah that's quite nice and again you know you, if you look at the perspective I'm shooting this from kind of chest level I've got the flip screen out it's not possible I, I found it very difficult to accurately zone focus with this camera because the depth of field is much narrower of course especially as I'm shooting wide open here 2.8 but again zooming in looking at the details it's fine it's very sharp it's uh, you know it's it's a kind of camera that's going to give you the most incredible resolution out of the images and that will really manifest itself better or at its best when they're printed I think okay same wedding um, outside in the afternoon drinks reception uh, some friends bride family sitting down having a chat Again, look at the detail, I know I keep going on about that, but really that's the, the kind of selling point in this camera. I'll just pop my filter on there, my colour filter, and uh, just going to straighten it. And of course it's a bit dark, there's dark skinned people in this image, so I'm just going to bring that up. And you know, the colour rendering and the colour rendition is lovely, and you've still got all of that beautiful blue tone in the green in the trees, and it's keeping the blues also. Um, it's just beautiful, you know, it really is beautiful to work with. And again, when these images are printed, that's really when it sings. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the other images that I took last year when I was renting the camera still and kind of trialing it. Um, back in Spain in the swimming pool, uh, this is Albi, I told you he didn't take that mask off at all. And again, you can see the detail there when I zoom in. I'm just going to straighten this up because it is doing my head in like that. And I had this camera, the camera was around my neck and kind of um, held precariously above the pool, um, but perfectly safe. And again, pop the filter on just to warm it all up. Zoom in again. Look, one one two thousand four hundredth of a second at f two point eight handheld, and you know it's a moment, and it's it's a nice moment that should we want to print this, and actually we do already have this in a little book, then it's gonna you know it's gonna look good. Now of course this image, these images I should say, are images that you are gonna get with any camera, any uh, APS-C camera or your DSLR or even your iPhone if you so wish. Um, but obviously we're talking about the details here and the dynamic range. Now in this image you can still see the colours are good there, I've just applied my filter but I'm going to bring down the, um, uh, the slider at the top just to bring some more detail into the blue because when I brightened up the image I lost the highlight area or the highlight area in the sky was a bit too bright and again look at the detail there, one thousandth of a second just over handheld, medium format, pretty good going huh? Okay, so let's talk about some JPEGs. Now, I don't think really that many people who are going to be investing in this system are going to be shooting JPEG. Um, they may, and I do, um, but I think that you know, if you're shooting, if you're spending six, seven, eight thousand pounds on a system, you're probably going to be shooting raw because you're probably going to be doing commercial work, fine art work, which is going to need the uh, latitude of the raw file for corrections and editing. However, the JPEGs, obviously, the Fujifilm are renowned for their JPEG quality. And you can see this, this one here. This is the one of I'll be crying, uh, bedtime in our house. And this is the raw file right in front of us right now. I'm just going to bring the brightness up. And this is the JPEG. Now, the JPEG initially out of the camera will look sharper because it's inheriting the sharpness settings of the camera itself. Um, obviously, those are not applied to the raw file. And so that looks a little bit softer. That looks sharper. But that, I mean, that JPEG is pretty beautiful you know straight out of the camera I've done nothing to that apart from brighten it up now the raw file does need work into it of course um, so I'm just going to pop my color filter on it again it brings it right down to darkness in this case um, obviously presets are only a starting point so I'm going to brighten it up I'm going to bring the highlight slide down slightly because we've got all that bright area on the left hand side of his face as we look at it and you know it's the detail in here is absolutely incredible Okay, let's have a look at a couple more. This is Rosa in the garden. I'm just immediately going to put the color filter on it. It's too contrasty, too warm. I'm going to bring the, a little bit too much, bring the temperature down slightly to make it more natural. And I'm going to pull the shadows up again. And, you know, look at the detail now. If I zoom in, uh, <laughs> where does she get those eyebrows from, I wonder? Um, but you can see it there, you know, the detail is just incredible. I know I'm beating a drum here. I keep talking about the details in these images. But really, and I can't show you properly because it's impossible to show you the quality of prints on a screen. But when they are printed, it's the most impressive thing. The, the images have soul to them, have depth, have feeling, and they just look beautiful. Okay, so I'm just trying to find a image that I know, uh, here it is, this is the, the image I've got. Um, 
oops, hold on, give me a second. I'm going through all kinds of images here that I've done some testing on and various different things and alien skin exposure and all sorts of stuff. So um, the image I want is this one here. And I, I want to use this one because I know that it was badly exposed. This is an Acros image that I shot on the day and this is the uh, finished edit, but we will go back to the raw file. I want to reset it for you. Uh, just let it render out, reset that image. So this is the original RAW file, and this is the original JPEG, black and white JPEG. And as you can see, uh, underexposed, way too dark. Look at the histogram there, stacked to the left. So let's do some work on the JPEG. I'm just going to drag it. So that's two stops before the bright, bright spots start to kind of break apart a little bit. So, you know, it's still pretty good for a JPEG. I think that's, that's good. Detail recovery, uh, highlight area, I'll just bring it back down. Now, if we go to the RAW file, um, now it's one four thousandth of a second, so you know it's, there's not enough light in this frame. So just going to drag it back up. But now you know we've definitely got. Although I'm going brighter purposely to show you, but you can see the detail that's in the entire image. And I would say there's probably five stops of extra dynamic range um, compared to maybe two, two and a half, three in the JPEGs. The raw files give us that latitude. So I'll just warm that image up with a preset and then zoom in. And again, look at the detail there. It's just, you know, incredible really. And you've got the water and the face and all this is handheld, remember. Okay, I shot it at two, the, the shutter speed is probably too fast, um, but trying to keep that aperture down. Uh, maybe I could have used the electronic shutter or an ND filter or something, but 63 mil, um, 2.8. Uh, it's a fun image and one of my favorite images, I think, from this little session last summer. Okay, what else we got? Okay, so here's another raw file in JPEG. So this is the JPEG, um, again, the 63 mil Acros plus R filter this will be. So I'm just going to straighten it up. Um, just add that punch preset in Lightroom, give it a little bit of exposure. I might adjust the tone curve on this one. Um, just pr uh, bring that up. Oh, I want to set that to, uh, that is on RGB. I want to set the tone curve to linear. So I just got the top and hit linear. Just going to bring the ha shadows and highlights, just pull them around slightly, just a classic S curve. And that's pretty good to go. So that's kind of seconds from that JPEG coming straight out of the camera. Um, I love those black and whites, of course, as you probably all well know. Um, again, look at that detail in there. It's got that lovely, that Acros film simulation has such a lovely filmic tone to it. It's beautiful, I love it. Um, the raw file, so let's just do the same thing, straighten it up. Um, I'll put my color filter on it just to, for a little bit of difference. And again, I'm going to bring the highlights up slightly. And then we go look at the detail there when it's rendered. Uh, it's pretty incredible, really, I think. Okay, so what else have we got? Let's see what we've got in the timeline down here that might be of use. Um, I think I did some stuff in the studio. Here we go. Let's have a look at some of these images. And uh, yeah, let's pick this one of Rosa. So this is the, um, the image loading right now is the uh, final image that I was trying to get to. Um, so again, look at that. This is 100% crop, zoom in, beautiful detail. Um, this is the uh, raw file, the original raw file, and this is the original JPEG. So both of those would need a little bit of work. So that JPEG itself and the raw file, just reset in both of them. And I think again, you know, if you look, you go right in, you can see all of that detail there. And this is again, 63 mil, 1125 F8. Punched, just lift it a little bit on the JPEG, bring the S curve into it. And we're getting the details that we need now. I'm just going to bring the blacks down, or the shadows down, I should say. Um, and the blacks, there we go, just to kind of darken it down. That's the look I was kind of after. Um, and that's kind of the finished thing once I'd finished working with it. And, you know, very contrasty, but, you know, black and white kind of dark, deep portrait that I was looking for of her. Um, but look at it, you know, the, the image itself is not relevant. It's the details there that I think are incredible. And I could print that. Okay, so I'm just going to show you now a slideshow of images from our summer holiday last year. This is actually already on my YouTube channel, so if you've seen it before, feel free to skip to the end, to the summary at the end. Um, but I think it's worthwhile popping this in now, and, you know, I hope you enjoy it.
Okay, so there we go. Hopefully you found that a little bit interesting or useful at least. Um, now I know obviously this video is uh, it's going to be bypassed by a lot of people because most people or many people are not going to be interested in GFX. Um, and like I said, I am, although I'm a Fujifilm ambassador, I've bought this, I've invested in it myself. So I'm showing this information uh, with the hope of passing on some helpful tips to you guys. And I think that, uh, as I said, many times it's about the prints, it's about the file quality. It's not a replacement for the X system in my mind, um, but it's a system, it's definitely a camera system that's at the, uh, probably at the beginning of its journey, it's quite embryonic, um, but I'm sure it will grow and I'm sure it will get better and they're already releasing amazing new lenses for it. So um, yeah, I hope you found it useful. And if you did, please subscribe to the channel, hit the bell in the bottom left-hand corner and I shall see you next time. Thank you.